the start of a new season here on Elwood City Limits. Now, of course, as usual, we are a bit limited by our release schedule in terms of how topical we can be. But I want to make sure that we get this out at least while in time while we are recording this. We are uh, as clear as possible. And, you know, it would be nice if this was all finished by the time that you're hearing this on the free feed, let's say. But, Lucas, I, I, I don't want to speak for you here, but I'm going to assume, I've known you for a long time, that you and I are probably both on the same side here when, when we say uh, we want to express our support and solidarity for our uh, Halifax Public Library's workers who are on strike right now. Absolutely. Uh, in our municipality. Yeah, that's correct. And this has been happening because, of course, the public library workers are uh, hoping to get a, a better deal than the one they have currently. As I say, when you're hearing this on the free feed, strike might be over. But as we are talking about it right now, the first week of September, uh, the strike is still ongoing. And Lucas, of course, you've mentioned many times, the library is something that is close to your heart. It's literally close to your family. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, something that is close to uh, to me as well. A big part of my life for a long time. Absolutely. Yeah. Full support. It, what kind of a podcast about uh, uh, an aardvark who goes to the library would this exactly. be if, if we didn't if we didn't say something like this? And yeah, wanted to get that right out on Front Street because, of course, this is Elwood City Limits, the episodic Arthur podcast. My name's Will Young. Lucas Mancini is my co-host. And depending on what time of the month you are listening to this at, this is a great time, speaking of Halifax, to go to vote.thecoast.ca. You can either continue to nominate us uh, under Best Podcast, or it may be voting time. So make sure to vote for us if you can. Uh, of course, you will need to uh, sign up at thecoast.ca, which will need a valid Canadian postal code. So... Uh, please keep that in mind, and we will continue to keep you updated on social media at what part of the process yes. we are in. Thank if you to everybody who has nominated us so far. If you're wondering where you can find a valid Canadian, or even if you want to be more specific, Halifax postal code, mm. uh, simply look up the Tim Hortons or McDonald's in Halifax, and there are <laughs> postal codes aplenty. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, hey, everybody who has already done so, thank you. This is our last kick. This is going to be our last kick at the can for this. Uh, we're going to be getting into a brand new season of Arthur in just a few moments. But before we do that, it's time for our emails. Limits at gmail.com. We do have a couple today. Uh, the first one, I believe this is from a first-time emailer whose name is Grace Irving. Hi, Will and Lucas. My name is Grace. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. I discovered your podcast a few years back, and it's quickly become my favorite Currently, I'm going through the backlog. I can't wait to get to season seven, as I think that was one of the strongest seasons. Uh, three of my favorite episodes of all time are in season seven. The World of Tomorrow, A Stitch in Time, and April 9th. Arthur was one of my favorite shows as a kid, and I still love it to this day. I love your takes on the episodes and the characters. My favorite characters are Ty between DW, Binky, and Sue Ellen. Wonderful choices. I'm not sure if you've talked about it, this on For the Kids, but I think it's so interesting how many Arthur voice actors were on other Canadian shows like Sagwa and What's With Andy. Now, this is me kind of showing my butt here a little bit. Oh. Did we do an episode on Sagwa? Yeah, oh, my goodness, Will. Yes, Sagwa. The yes, we did. The Siamese Chinese cat. Uh, that's we... a classic For the Kids. That's what, I think that was like one of the first three we did. First 10. That was number 10, and that was all the way back in 2020. So forgive me if my memory of 2020 is not as bright as it used to be. Uh, but yes, lots of different turnover. I mean, hey, Canada has some really great voice actors, and they, they get around. Would love to see you two talk about the 1997 Pippi Longstocking if you haven't already. I vaguely remember watching it as a kid. What I remember the most was that Pippi had a very familiar-sounding voice. Come to find out she's voiced by Muffy herself, Melissa Altro. Um, it, that particular cartoon, I know it well, it was a Teletoon cartoon. I, the only time I remember watching that show was when I was sick and there was nothing on. So no offense if you like that. It was not as important to my childhood as it was to others, clearly. Pippi Longstocking was always confusing to me because that type was so familiar in, in different types of media. And what I mean is... I always kind of got Pippi, in the same way, you know, I always talked about how I would call sticking around little Arthur. I kind of thought they yeah. were the same guy because they looked alike. When I was a kid, I was like, is it Pippi Logstocking? Is she the same lady as Anna Green Gables? Is that the same lady as the Wendy's <laughs> lady? I kind of got them all mixed up. 
But Pippi Longstocking, uh, she's like lifting heavy stuff in the intro, right? She's like a pirate or something. Yeah, she's like really strong, and uh, I think her father is an explorer or something. So she's doesn't have her parents aren't around very much. I don't know if she is a mother, and yeah, she's just kind of strange, like strange, I suppose, almost like a Mary Poppins sort of figure in that way. I guess I don't know. I, I don't claim to know a whole lot about Pippi Longstocking. Speaking of Muffy, I found the Veruca Salt comparison you made in the most recent episode to be quite accurate. I must ask, how would you cast an Arthur Willy Wonka? Uh, okay, so... Buster's Mike TV. Okay, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, uh, that's agreed. Who's, okay, so we already have Muffy's Veruca Salt, Buster's Mike TV. It's been a long time since I've seen any iteration of this, so... I hate the to character say character names are going to escape me, yeah. Uh, Arthur is Augustus Gloop. He's always eating so? that cake. Oh, oh. <laughs> so then who is who's like the who's like the Charlie? Who would be a good Charlie? Charlie Bucket? Mm, um, yeah. probably like um someone like pure of heart. Yeah, it it would probably be like probably be Fern it gives me Charlie Bucket vibes. I was I was thinking maybe someone adventurous like Sue Ellen, but I like that yeah, we're Yeah, Sue Ellen works kind of as well. trending towards girl. What about and Wonka himself? Like well, we're also forgetting Violet Beauregard. Uh, oh, sure. Wonka himself is definitely going to be like a Mr. Rapper. Uh, he's got a flair for the eccentric for sure. Um, the problem yeah, Violet, is I don't really Violet remember Beauregard. anything about Violet Beauregard besides the fact that she really wanted to eat the blueberry gum. Um, I'm thinking Prunella, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that works, I think. Do you want to have DW or Binky as the Oompa Loompas? Uh, WDW. All right, I, I I I wish I could I, I I don't have great memory of this, so I'm I don't know where Binky fits into this, but I want to make him fit in somehow. Binky could be um oh my god the evil guy, that the shadowy figure that wants to buy Charlie's golden. Oh ticket. sure, okay man, I gotta see this movie again. Oh the seventies uh, one is is phenomenal. Yes, I remember watching it on TV and like not expecting when I was when I was younger, not expecting it to be all that good but then being surprised at how good it was i will I, I i would like to watch that again all the way through uh so there you go uh arthur willy wonka thank you for your time keep up the amazing content thank you grace and we have one here from caleb cote hey will lucas and mike you guys are starting season 23 finally only two more short seasons after this one about your eighth anniversary of the pod, congratulations. This is one of my favorite podcasts. I always get excited to see you guys come up on my feed. Your episodes are always interesting. I have grown apart from Arthur over the years, finding it a bit too childish at times. <laughs> but I do really enjoy this podcast. It's also always interesting when Will has a guest host that doesn't know too much about the newer seasons of Arthur. Well, stay tuned for that. Anyway, these episodes of Arthur are interesting in a way. So let me ask a few questions. Did you guys have any urban legends in your town when you grew up? I had a few, but they might be a bit too disturbing to share in the email, so I will leave that part up to your imaginations. Uh, urban Halifax urban legends. Well, we have one that I can think of. I mean, I'm sure we have many, uh, but the one I can think of is that we have a local, um, I get I, like fun fair that travels around the province every summer, and it usually it's coming into Halifax uh, sets up for a very rainy time, uh, a very rainy day based on like a uh, hundred year old curse or something. Uh, I mean, there's the glove guy. Oh, that's right, not really glove an urban, guy. That's not really an urban legend. I think that's a real guy. That's just a real creepy guy. Is glove guy still around? I don't think he was ever convicted of a crime. I don't think he's as active as he used to be. Um, there's an excellent, one of the other podcasts that was, uh, nominated for the best of Halifax award. I can't remember what it was called, but there's an excellent investigative journalism about the glove guy. Basically there was a guy who sold leather gloves on a website, but he would also drive around Halifax late at night, hoping to pick up drunk young men. And he wouldn't do anything too duplicitous, except he would get them to try on his gloves. And he would always be like, try on my gloves. I'll give you a free ride home. Um, and there's been legends over the years of people getting picked up by the glove guy. I'm sure we have more than that, but yeah, those are the ones that kind of come to mind. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I'm sure there are even darker ones than that. The episode is called Fright Night. Wasn't there another episode called Night Fright? There was, actually. 
Uh, wouldn't expect them to pretty much use the same title, but switch the words around. Citizen Shake might be the most America-focused Arthur ever gets because we know Elwood City is in the United States, but they never make it extremely explicit that it is besides showing a president. Well, I guess DW goes to Washington is pretty American, but it's not focused on America. One final question here. What do you guys think Arthur could tackle if they ever rebooted it? My hope is they tackle visual impairment. I know they already did that with Marina, but they could always do more for any disability. But me being both visually impaired and autistic, I feel like Marina and Carl are only one person with a visual impairment slash autism, but they aren't the entire community. They could show people who aren't completely blind and just have low vision, et cetera, et cetera. So that's from Caleb Cote. Uh, I feel like we've talked about this a couple of times, but like newer topics to discuss. I mean, they're kind of doing this with the, those Arthur digital shorts that they have every once in a while. So um, libraries, um, a couple of years ago, racism, um, but if they were to do like a full on new thing, I mean, it's, social media, social media would have to be there, I guess. It's a little hack, though. You know, it, it, yeah. the thing that's yeah. tough about this question is the Arthur episodes I tend to like the most, especially the most kind of moral based ones, because um, obviously I really like just the funny ones as well. You know, if we were going to get an Arthur episode about wrestling or something like that, me and Will would be <laughs> a fan. But the ones that are kind of based on morals, the ones I like the most uh, are ones that really surprise me. When they're tackling a subject that wouldn't be at the top of mind, that, that doesn't come to mind quickly, and those are the ones that really stay out and stay in my head. You know, Grandpa Dave's Country Farm that's tackling uh, dealing with an aging family member who thinks they can still handle everything themselves but actually needs to learn how to ask for help. Um, the Blizzard tackling overcoming... Uh, socioeconomic barriers and coming together as a community. Um, these are things that aren't, you know, as simple as, you know, this thing's bad, this thing's good. Uh, and those are my favorite Arthur episodes that are moral based. So it's hard for me to come up with one because if I'm coming up with it, you know, uh, maybe I would think it was hack or obvious, right? So uh, I guess I'll just say, yeah, an Arthur episode about wrestling, perhaps. <laughs> Um, yeah, I know what you mean. I'm watching, I'm watching a show right now, a fairly new show called, uh, Evil. And, uh, whenever they talk about, like, a newer issue, it's from the right position. It's, like, from the right position. It's from a position I agree with, but it is also, it always feels a little bit hack. And, like, you're explaining to your parents what TikTok is. And it's just like, ah, I don't like it. So, I don't know if I'd want Arthur to necessarily do that. It's tough to say. But I agree with you, Lucas. A lot of the best episodes are evergreen. It's about stuff that you would be dealing with no matter uh, where you were in time. And they speak out across generations, really. Thanks, everybody, for the emails at elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. We also want to say thank you to our patrons at patreon.com slash elwoodcitylimits. Don't forget, patrons, you can listen to our latest episode of ECL Origins right now. Me and Lucas had a great time talking about Naruto a little bit about its history and about our feelings on it. And it's uh, learn a lot about Lucas. That was, that's a really great, if you're a Lucas head, yeah. uh, you got, you got to listen to that one. You're, you're going to find out a lot about him. Yeah. <laughs> you're eating for sure. Uh, so yeah, that's coming up. And in September, we are going to have the new episode of for the kids. In fact, well, we're going to save that for the kids talk for the end of the episode, but it's going to be a big one. So we will talk about it in a little bit. In fact, kind of relates to the email that we just read. And, of course, we want to thank by name some of our lovely patrons. As I go into my Excel document, that's people like Light Relentless, Teresa, Kevin Noon, Peebs, or Pretty Cool Stairs, Michelle Sprzynski, JHC, and Vinny Cataldo, Emma, Cecil Robinson, or is it Cecil Robinson? I always forget. Sorry. Tiki Barber Fan, Ann Perry, Blendy, uh, Rowan S. and Biblio, and our latest uh, patron, friend of the show, Colton. Thank you, Colton. And thanks, everybody, for supporting us. Patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. It's the start of a new season. Big quotes around season. Arthur season 23, or as Lucas, I begin to think of them now as the Arthur OVAs, because ah. this is the, well, this is the shortest season of the show yet. Only three episodes, and one of them's a double. So we'll be done with this one before you know it. And really not all that much to say with, you know, seasons 22 to 25 were made, produced in the same block. So 
what we've talked about in season 22 is true here. This one aired from October 14th to 16th, 2019. Uh, the episodes also aired slightly out of order, I'm to understand. So if you saw these in a different order than when we're covering it, uh, you know, that's not your fault. It's a PBS thing. Uh, I always like to ask, where were we uh, the week of October 14th to 16th, 2019? Elwood City Limits aired episode 110 on October 12th, which featured patron and friend of the show, Andrew Power. Andrew, I hope all's well. Andrew just had a comic come out. You should, uh, yes. you should check that out. I believe Follow he's us. talking about putting out an online edition. So yeah, check out Andrew Power's, let's see, what's his Twitter? Scary Mask yeah, on scary Twitter mask and Instagram. Scary Mask on Twitter, yeah. Definitely do that. So, yeah, tw and 2019, late 2019, um, I got married, like, half a year before this. And uh, we're just kind of, like, do we're just kind of, like, doing stuff. Hey, it's 2019. I'm uh, I'm working at a parking garage. The nothing's wrong with the world. I'm just do doing my 9-to-5 thing. And yeah, nothing bad's going to happen in six months. If you were going to try and get me to recall a year... Uh, the most difficult one would probably be 2019. I feel like it's been totally wiped out of my brain due to 2020. I have no idea. Well, either way, we were definitely still holding it down. Elwood City Limits just passed 100 episodes, so it's funny to look back on that now. And we start season 23. I mean, Lucas, I know that you have typically your fall is very busy, so I'm very thankful that you were here for this. I w it would have It would have hurt me if you had missed out on specifically – our first story here, Fright Night. And we'll get into why in just a second. Because the episode starts off with Buster. He's telling DW and Bud a story about the time, a scary story. He's got the flashlight under his face. It's a dark and stormy night. About the time he encountered a lichen bunny. There's nothing really to say about this cold open, but I do want to bring up something, Lucas, that I just discovered and told you today. Since, since he's here in the scene, um... Bud sounds like the Hawk Tua girl. Yes, you messaged me that today. The congrats to the Hawk Tua girl uh, for Tua Talk. Or is it Hawk Talk? Talk, talk, talk Tua? Tua. Okay, two tries. Wow, third time's the charm. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I don't really have an opinion either way on the Hawk Tua girl. I like the memes where it's just like a really old meme. And then the punchline is Hawk Tua in an attempt to yeah. make like the most unfunny meme ever. Like, Sar sure, yeah. Like, um, oh my gosh, I'm trying to remember these like ancient memes, like uh, sarcastic Velociraptor, and these <laughs> like, what if Hawk Tua? And it's like, wow, that's that sure is a brain rot meme right there. I can um, Hawk Tua. Yeah, yeah, me gusta Hawk Tua. That like <laughs> Hawk Tua entering the annals of you know skibbity toilet. Uh, Phantom Tax, Ohio, uh, Kai Sanat, um, Rizzler, th those kinds of things were just kind of nonsense to say as a punchline. I'm all for it. Um, but, you know, to the Hawk Tua girl, what's her name? we got to put some respect on her Haley, name. Haley Weston? Yeah, I would go as far as to say I like Haley Weston more than I like Bud. Though, uh, <laughs> Haley Weston, people are always writing in what celebs should they had on Arthur. Here you go. Uh, Bud's long lost cousin. <laughs> Oh wow, Hawk to a girl has her own Wikipedia. Why? Why wouldn't she? Uh, why wouldn't she? She's an international celebrity. Will how dare but you? Can, but can I get her stupid name? Like there's ha Welch, Haley Welch. Yeah. So, but but she had like a she had a trailer for her new podcast that's coming out, and she's literally just like, "My name's Haley Welch, and I'm gonna da 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 da." And I'm like, "That's Bud. That's <laughs> that's Louisiana Bud right there." I she's not from Louisiana. She's from Texas, but Bud's accent is somewhere in the south and i guess it's from around where uh, Haley welch grew up so <laughs> i don't think i don't think bud's around for too much longer question mark so i'm glad we made this discovery while he's still here anyway lucas the reason why i wanted you to be here for this other than you know i like talking to you and having you Aww. on the show generally but this episode is all about how buster is being babysat by his uncle bob and uncle bob is voiced by somebody that we've spoken about here and there over the years. Who would that be? Uh, it's R.L. Stein, the author of the Goosebumps books. And it's a funny get because I didn't realize it was R.L. Stein until the end of the episode. 
Cause, really? You didn't? Well, no, I don't know what the guy looks like or sounds like. I'm only familiar with his literature. It's like if there was a Arthur episode co-starring William S. Burroughs. I would have no idea <laughs> until they told me at the end, right? So uh, I knew, based off the subject matter, that this was hearkening to some sort of famous children's horror author. Arthur, excuse me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Arthur, author. Oh, my goodness. Uh, especially when they start pulling out the fake kind of horror books i was like okay this is obviously and because there's an introduction of a new character who's somewhat generic looking you know buddy with glasses i was like this is obviously based off someone but i didn't know who it was exactly uh until the end of the app okay i knew about this coming into it i i had just heard about it within the last few years uh and the voice sounded a little bit familiar to me because when goosebumps was on tv ever like there were a couple of episodes that had the uh, the Todd McFarlane spawn treatment where it's like a live action. Well, it's all live action, but like it would be like zooming into him and like, hi, I'm R.L. Stein. I write the Goosebumps books. And with that kind of level of read on him. That's uh, kind of, and I, again, you know, as much of a spawn head I am, you know, I'm a fan of that type of intro. <laughs> I should find some and put them in the in the ECL Patreon discord. Um, so, yeah, Uncle Bob voiced by Earl Stein. I will just say that, like, listen, we've had the gamut of celebrity voices here, and uh, R.L. Stein is a friend and collaborator of Mark Brown, so it makes sense that he would be here and in kind of a spooky time episode. He's all right. I would say that he's just awkward enough to be funny. Like, there are some deliveries he had in here that were, like, not very good, but I was still kind of giggling through them, so it's like, it's fine. It's really fine. It's his design that I had a little bit of a of trouble with and it's again not the way he looks but i noticed you know we don't really we've gotten used to the way that the show looks by now but there's still every once in a while a little hitch here and there in the way the animation comes across that kind of takes me out of it um i found that uncle bob's mouth and combined with the way that he's moved around in the toon boom program looks really weird at times it looks a bit herky-jerky and his mouth well, his mouth it has that weird like it has like an uh like a colored in upper lip but not a colored in bottom lip which i always i always have thought looked weird it's i always associate it with one of the the me mouths one of the options uh like oh yeah from uh uh like making knees on the Wii for those not in the know. But yeah, I, I agree with you specifically about the mouth. I think the problem is no other Arthur character has a mouth like that. And they obviously gave them that mouth to make it not just look like Mac David, you know, try to make <laughs> him look a little bit more like R.L. Stein. But the problem is there's a reason no other Arthur character has a mouth like that. And it's because it does kind of look odd in practice. So uh, there's actually, there's one other, um, I suppose meta thing I want to bring up, and this is from again the Arthur Wiki, which is always I always have that window open when I'm watching the episode. His name is Bob Baxter, but the Arthur Wiki made me realize this: Bob has a last name as Bitsy, who is his sister, but he's not related to Bo Baxter. So Bo, uh, Bitsy took Bo Baxter's name when she's married, I think, and then where does Bob get Baxter from? Oh, yeah. I'm... Wait a minute. <laughs> we have to bust open the family tree on this one. That, yeah. huh. Yeah. Weird, eh? That I, maybe he's actually like, no, because he can't be like a step uncle or an uncle in law because we see them as kids. Yes. Well, maybe uh, Buster's dad took Betsy's name. That's the only explanation. And then kept it in the divorce. Mm-hmm. Oh uh, yeah, no, that's I'm, I'm I suppose it's it's uh, it's unusual, but it checks out. I guess that would have to be the only wow. Have to be How the only patriarchal way. of you, Will? You know, they're, they're yeah, the, yeah. Your the right. Baxters are of a new breed. They're 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 unconventional in many ways. So who am I? Who am I to judge? Buster's Uncle Bob is babysitting him while Bitsy is away, and being R.L. Stein, he tells him a spooky story about when he and Bitsy were kids and they were vacationing in a cabin and they heard what he says is the lichen bunny essentially sort of a werewolf uh when they were vacationing they heard the call of the lichen bunny in the night but we don't get much further in the story he leaves part two to the next day quick note here 
that I, again, Arthur Wiki, thank you. Uh, the voice of young Bob is former voice of Arthur Cameron Ansel, who was Whoa. the voice of Arthur from seasons 9 to 11. Love it when they do this. I know, me too. Lichen bunnies. The story is that, like, as as Bob says, lichen bunnies, you know, under the full moon, they grow fur and claws. But most of these animals that we're talking about already have fur. If it if it was okay, as we I'm glad see, you as brought we talk this about up. later in the episode. Uh, does Bob like if we think Bob is the lichen bunny? Is he growing fur on top of fur? Like, uh, I, I'm glad you brought this up because I was going to mention that too. Like when he says, <laughs> "Oh, they grow furs," I'm like, "Oh, next you're going to be like, and they get animal ears poking out of their heads." <laughs> he described every you know, not every Arthur character has claws or fangs, but they have pretty much everything else he describes. Yeah, so he leave he leaves part one. Part two is going to be happening uh, tomorrow night. And, of course, being Buster, this makes him believe that lichen bunnies are real. And he's talking to Arthur about this. In fact, he looked them up in the Encyclopedia of Creatures in the Dark, which is a book written by Beatrix Traub. And right away, I'm smarter than a children's show. I was like, that looks like an anagram, but I couldn't quite put it put it together wow. yet. I probably should. I probably should have, you know judging by how the story ends up. So the next night, he tells part two of the story, which is further in how seemingly how close the lichen bunny came to the cabin and that it spooked a raccoon that was clawing at the door to be let in and was very scared by something. At this point, Buster begins to think that Uncle Bob is a lichen bunny because he asks Buster for nail clippers because apparently the lichen bunnies have long fingernails. And then later... Uh, Buster sees the after effects of Uncle Bob shaving, which can only be because he's a lichen bunny. So he enlists the help of Arthur, who he's telling all of this stuff to, and they end up setting traps and stocking up on methods to war out, ward off lichen bunnies, according to this encyclopedia. So they create like this slime trap, and then that will uh, enable a laundry basket to fall and ensnare whoever's coming through the door. They also put garlic everywhere, and they sleep on like beds of sticks that will apparently ward off. So Arthur is staying for a sleepover and Uncle Bob is in the middle of telling part three where they apparently found the lichen bunny in the forest. But he doesn't get to that part because Arthur and Buster realize that it's a full moon. So they get scared and they run away from Uncle Bob, but they end up getting caught in their in their own traps. And it's at this point when the boys are very scared that Uncle Bob admits that... He moonlights as a writer of scary stories. And in fact, he, Rob Baxter, is actually Beatrix Traub. Uh, this, again, totally, I, I was uh, not intelligent enough to figure out that Beatrix Traub was an anagram. In fact, I was like, is this referencing some famous children's author? Uh, so I was pretty blindsided by this. I was like, oh my gosh, he wrote the book. Um, it worked on me. A couple of notes about this whole exchange. For one, yes. I noticed a piece of artwork in the Baxter household that's kind of a reference to season one Arthur. Did you okay. notice the, oh my goodness, did I wrote the Piet, uh, I'm going to butcher his French name, the Piet Mondrian, Mondrian uh, painting in Buster's living room. It's like one of those abstract paintings with the blue, yellow, and the red. It's a reference to the painting that Buster, uh, that Binky realizes is hung upside down in the Elwood City Limits Art Gallery, uh, no, all the way I'm back totally, in season one. I totally missed that. Good um, eye. I'm, I'm just scrubbing through the episode now. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah. And yeah, that might have been. It, it, it does look similar to that. It might have been in, in previous episodes, but I've never noticed it before. The other thing I would say is uh, um, the. Uh, just kind of wanted to reminisce about old fake encyclopedias. Like, if I, if encyclopedia. <laughs> Before the internet, before creepy pasta, the excitement you would feel when you read an encyclopedia of a bunch of fake stuff, you know, Dragonology, uh, those types of books, um, watching them flip through it when they're showing the kind of like, oh, and these were the, the lichen bunnies from, from Asia, that these were the lichen bunnies from that part of the world. Those books were so awesome back when you were a kid. I was talking about something like this recently when uh, a friend of mine, myself and a friend, 
came across the official Pokemon handbook in like a thrift store. And you went, yeah, pre the internet being the internet it is now, it was like, uh, I had my mom pay $10 at a Scholastic book order for the official Pokemon encyclopedia, which tells you all the information you need to know about the first 150 Pokemon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so much better than having to turn on your ad blocker and go on, um, what is the fan wiki website that, like, every wiki is? Do you know what oh, I'm talking about? Uh, f- fandom? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Horrible website. I would much rather uh, crack open some tome uh, full of fake facts. Or read my cousin's eyewitness book that is all about the Justice League. Yeah, exactly. What I really like about this last part of the episode is that it is very good at recreating the feel of a Goosebumps story. So... This whole thing, the way this is told, is effectively an Arthur version of a Goosebumps story, especially since, like, Uncle Rob is breaking up all of the parts of the story like chapters. And if you remember reading Goosebumps books, like, they're all broken up and they they leave on these cliffhangers and they're very, like, readable. And what I also liked is that the end of the episode sees Buster taking the Lycan Bunny story that was told to him by Uncle Rob, because the... The message here is that, you know, Uncle Rob says that storytelling is taking things that really happened and then making them more interesting. And then that way other people can pass on the story. So this is how Buster passes it on. The end of his Lycan Bunny story is that the Lycan Bunny was really a shape-shifting alien, which is actually true to how a lot of Goosebumps stories end. Like a lot, a lot of those stories end with some kind of specifically science fiction twist. And I thought that was a really fun way to kind of pay homage to the series that R.L. Stein made famous. Anyway, yeah, like it just ends with uh, Buster telling, uh, finishing his like and bunny story and it manages to kind of freak out DW and bud. And now a word from us kids. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the, hey, just like Uncle Bob made up the Lycan Bunny, these cl- this class of kids is making up their own fantastical creatures. So first they draw them, and then they construct them from recycling materials, which seems like a really fun project to do. Yeah, I didn't. I don't really have a lot to say personally. I will. I will say that a lot of these uh, fantastical creatures are just kind of combinations of animals, including one that's twenty different animals at the same time. Yeah, just a lot of creativity. Um, sometimes a good word from us kids subject falls in their lap, uh, and they can make one that's really related to the episode and showcases a bunch of kids' creativity, which is really some of the best word from us kids stuff. Um, and I thought this was great. These kids were coming up with monsters that I felt were way beyond what my imagination would be capable of if I was given this task. So this was this was a good one. Supporting this podcast is how it keeps going, and it's very easy to do. So here's how you can do that. If you're listening to this show and want to get the full back catalog of Elwood City Limits and all of its sister shows and offshoots, you can listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, and even more services. You can also go to our YouTube page, youtube.com slash Elwood City Limits, for the full back catalog. If we aren't on a service you use, please let us know. You can interact with us on social media. We're on Twitter, at ECL Podcast, Instagram, at at Elwood City Limits and twitch.tv slash Elwood City Limits pod for our occasional streams. We're also on Facebook and Tumblr. Feel free to reach out to us on social media or you can email us and your email might be right on the show. Elwood City Limits at gmail.com. Finally, for exclusive content, including entire side series like For the Kids, a PBS Kids podcast and ECL Origins, subscribe to us for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. That's all for now. Thanks a lot for listening. And now, back to the show. And now, back to Arthur! And we move on here, like, completely switching gears from, like, a spooky story to Citizen Shake. Now, when we say Shake, that's C-H-E-I-K-H, Shake, the character who was previously featured in Season 14 in the episode In My Africa, which we've actually covered twice on this podcast, once uh, with me and Lucas more recently, and also with me and Kara Oliver. So if you want to learn more about Shake, check out those episodes. But we don't start off with Shake. We start off with a uh, cold open with Arthur. And hey, we've got to say, 
Uh, we have already have a lot more Arthur than the last season in both these episodes, so good. Prizes are the best most of the time. Arthur demonstrates this. He's playing some kind of first-person archaeology game, and he finds a cache of golden scarabs. But uh, the downside to this at the end of the cold open is that he also opens a tomb of mummies that look like DW. So this is like this feels like a combination of like Uncharted and Mist or something. This game. Yeah, I well see it's interesting because I thought it looked like almost like a boomer shooter. The rate he's mm. throwing out these onks. But we've kind of now seen this kind of revenge of the movie. Whenever they make a video fake video game in Arthur, it's always either the underwater one or Revenge of the Mummy style where it's kind of yeah. mummy themed. And we're now seeing, we're late enough in Arthur that I think we're finally past the PS1. This seems to be some sort of PS2, or given the timing, even a PS3 or PS4 game. Um, hmm. And it was interesting to see how much of the genre has changed from the original one was a side-scroller. You know, from from those early uh, Confuse the Goose kind of being a mini game to then be like a text adventure. And then the original revenge of the movie movie was like a side scroller. Say that five times fast. Now it's yeah. like a full on first person adventure game. Yeah. It's, it, you're right. It is. It is interesting. Like, uh, yeah. Fish finder six is, is the one. And that's been in like various handheld that, that went from like a tiger electronics game to a game boy game. Interesting to track the development of video games through Arthur. That would be a fun niche video essay to do. Other unpleasant surprises, Buster getting a bunch of cavities uh, and brain trying to create lemonade but failing from scratch. So uh, surprises are the best most of the time. So this whole episode has to do with the fact that Shake, his parents, are studying for and eventually pass their American citizenship test and interview. And they and Shake are going to be sworn in at the naturalization ceremony and will become American citizens. Before we get into the meat of that, this, we really start off at DW's school, where she and Bud and Shake are having lunch. So DW's lunch, cheese sticks and apple and raisins. Ugh. You had me up until raisins. No thank you. Uh, this is pretty weird. Um, or wait, wait, sorry. This is just the lunch, the cheese sticks and apple and raisins? Or this is not the... Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, there's... There's a lot of fun, weird food stuff coming up in this episode. Oh, yeah, you better believe it. Bud has sweet pickles, sour pickles, and between pickles. <laughs> and then Shake has what's called a fataya, which is a Senegalese deep-fried pastry that's filled with either chicken or fish, french fries, and fried egg, which sounds good to me. It I sounds divine. I know. And though I do uh, want to try some of those in between pickles. Yeah, I don't know exactly like sweet is sweet and sour kind of balancing in uh, in one. <laughs> Mommy uh, pickles. Ooh, okay. Um DW and Bud try to uh, ask for a fataya, but Shake only has one because his parents are so busy. When DW goes over to Shake's house to play, we find out that Shake is a fan of the wrestler, speaking of wrestling, named Leaping Lion, who is apparently the best in all of Africa. This will actually come back. So once we discover that Sheikh's family are studying for and then are successful for the citizenship test to America, Sheikh is a little confused and he's a little worried that becoming an American citizen might mean he'll have to give up the things from his Senegalese culture and heritage that he really likes, that are a big part of his life. We saw this with the Fataya, with Leaping Lion, uh, DW and him play on his drum. And this also leads DW to wonder if she is an American citizen. So we do explain to her and to the younger audience that if you're born in America, then you are an American citizen automatically, whereas Sheikh was not born in America. Uh, we do see we do get this quick cutaway, and I mentioned this with Uncle Bob. Uh, we see a brief thing of grown up DW who uh, is voting for the first time when she's presumably eighteen, and we see her go into the vote and come out. The little movement that she makes when she comes out of the booth and is like, "I voted, woohoo!" looked like mildly cursed. It looked really weird. And I put oh. the I put the gifts from both of these things on our Discord and just like ugh, it 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 off put me a little. Uh I'm here to answer the question that I'm sure is on all the viewers lips. 
uh, DW voted for the Libertarian Party. <laughs> wow, man, she becomes a cop and a Libertarian. Oh, yeah. what happened to that? What happened to that sweet little girl we loved? <laughs> man, oh man. But yes, Lucas, you alluded to it before. Uh, <laughs> where did they get? Who did they get this idea from? Was it Buster? Uh, DW says Arthur told her about it. That it's the most okay. American food. The most American food that you can make is something called Stars and Stripes Stew, which is tomatoes, mashed potatoes, and blueberries. Oh, no, it is. It's Buster because he says, to oh, yeah. me, it's what America tastes like. So tomatoes, mashed potatoes, and blueberries. Like, I can handle tomatoes and mashed potatoes, maybe even tomatoes and blueberries. But all three of those, I don't know. The, the, it is a, it is a stretch even for me. But the saving grace for this one is, you know, mashed potatoes with a sweet item is not unheard of. If you think yeah. about cranberries at Thanksgiving, yeah. Um, but also tomatoes probably tomatoes all matched up into mashed potatoes probably makes a weird texture for sure. Um, yeah. it's funny though. It's Ooh, one of those I, foods, I just thought about it. I don't like it. Ugh. It's one of those foods that looks better animated than it would in real life. Like if you think about what it would actually be like in real life, it is pretty kind of gross texturally. <sighs> the animated one they're all eating from looks low key good to me though. Like it, like the blueberries would get broken pretty easily and would just probably turn the whole thing blue. And then you would have the tomatoes and mashed potatoes kind of fighting for textural supremacy. Again, don't like it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I brought it up, but we have to. Another thing is that, like, everybody becomes aware of Sheikh uh, becoming naturalized as an American citizen, and everybody is congratulating him. Brain gives the family free Sundays. Binky comes by, and his gift to welcome Sheikh to America is by inducting him into the Uncle Slam fan club, the wrestler Uncle Slam. Uh, and apparently, as Shake says, you can't have two favorite wrestlers. So he kind of begrudgingly is like, I guess I have to like Uncle Slam now. By the way, Binky comes into this like skateboarding with uh, stars and striped knee pads and helmet. It looks awesome. I love his America gear. Yeah, and it's funny because you could kind of see where this episode is going from this bit. But there is something endearing. You know, Binky's really just trying to extend his culture uh, and he gives him a whole T-shirt. You know, there, there's an enthusiasm that's palpable with Binky here. Yes, and and of course, like everybody means well, and Shake is still trying to figure out exactly how he feels about all of this. But you can tell that he's not sh not sure about all of this. He doesn't even really understand what it means. In fact, that night he has a nightmare that he goes to school and all of the his Senegalese things that we've seen him with. So his his food his drum, his daishiki, all get taken away from him or kind of shamed from him. This is a really interesting choice. Like, in his dream, his classmates are portrayed, like, they're not, like, ripping it off of him or anything or, like, forcibly taking them away. They're kind of shaming him. Like, every time, like, he, like his shirt comes off and you see, and DW's like, oh, you're wearing your daishiki? And the kids literally go, I don't know if you can hear that, but it's like they're literally tisk tisking him. It's a really gross mouth noise, actually. Yeah, I'm sorry. I won't. I won't do it anymore. But it, it it's so. It's a really interesting way to frame this. It's different than like, oh, the kids just like take it away and make off with it or something. And then at the back of the class, Uncle Slam is crying because Shake doesn't like him, and Shake has to be like, no, no, I, I, I like you fine. Like it's okay. Uh, but it's this idea that. It's not that these will be forcibly taken away from him. It's that in assimilating into America, he will just be uh, essentially – what's the word I'm looking for here? Like he will be um, not for, not forced, but coerced, coerced I suppose. Yeah. yeah, coerced into, um, into giving up all the things of his nationality that give him pride and joy. And this comes to a head – when he's at the toy store the next day with his mom and brain, he's allowed to get a toy and he's like, I guess I, I guess I have to get uncle slam. But even though there are cool uh, new toys of leaping lion, and this is where he gets a little bit teary eyed. And he explains that he doesn't want to have to give up all of the stuff that he loves about his culture. And his mom and brain explain that he doesn't have to uh, in America. And this, of course, this is very idealistic, but this is what we should be aspiring to. 
Uh, I say this as a Canadian. So, but in America, their culture is made up of all kinds of different cultures. You know, the old melting pot uh, thing. In fact, Brain makes a point with the Autobionica robot toys, which are uh, cars, different cars that combine into one robot. And the cars are still the same cars, even when they combine into a different robot. So that's how he ex breaks it down for Shake, is that, if anything, as an American, he should embrace his cultural identity even more. This is and, a uh, yeah. such an effective allegory for American diversity, not only because, you know, on a surface level, and the intended message is true, that diversity is strength, and, and the differences of the um, subjects of America... Uh, is what makes it, uh, you know, stronger as a result, all coming together. Mm. But it also is a doubly uh, effective allegory in that, of course, America is a bunch of collectible robot toys that you have to buy, <laughs> and they all fit together that way. Uh, yeah, no, that's... <laughs> I didn't even think about that, but that is funny how he kind of breaks it down there. And we see Sheikh and his family going through the ceremony. They are officially sworn in as American citizens. And there's a celebration back at DW school with uh, all of Sheikh's friends. And they celebrate with fatayas and music. And uh, uh, he finally says that, like, Uncle Slam is not his favorite wrestler. It's actually Leaping Lion. And great quote from Sheikh here. Being an American means we are free to not like whatever we want. I'm like, you better believe it, pal. <laughs> But yeah, the, we ended on a very, very positive note there. And that's the start of season 23. That's our debut episode. And we have two more after this in this Arthur OVA. Let's go back to uh, Fright Night and the debut of Uncle Bob uh, with guest R.L. Stein. Lucas, what did you think of Fright Night? Not Night Fright, as we mentioned, which is, a, which is the Nightlight episode, but Fright Night. Listen, it's not reinventing the wheel. It's not anything we've never seen before, but it was... Just a really fun time. Classic guest episode. Here's this family member that we've never seen before. It's this famous person. But I thought it was a great... And, and you know, you said, Will, that it's hard for us to be topical with these episodes, uh, given how far we record in advance and stuff of, like that. Um, but this got me ready for the fall, you know, the spooky season that's coming in a couple weeks. Um, I thought this was a great episode atmospherically. I thought this was a good episode in terms of pacing, you know, cutting back between the spooky story and then Buster becoming more paranoid in real life. Uh, these bikers outside my window agree with me. They also <laughs> think it's a really good episode. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, it's nothing spectacular, but as far as late period Arthur, I thought this was really enjoyable. I agree. I like this episode too. You're, you're right. It's not going to be, it's not, didn't blow my socks off or anything, but I, I think I really responded to it because of how respectful it seems to be to R.L. Stein and to the Goosebumps series, which I like Goosebumps fine. I'm not like a huge fan of it or anything, but it was a cool way to see Arthur interpret a series that kind of grew up alongside it in a way. Um, and I thought that the the uh, framing of the story was fun. R.L. Stein, it was fun to have him around as a guest voice. Again, he's not the best voice actor, but it's like he he does enough to like at least keep me entertained. And the whole story reminded me of when I was a kid, and I was also very interested in uh, parapsychology for a little bit. That's how I know a couple of our local uh, urban legends. Uh, I should see. I wonder if I still have those books. I'll have to see if I can dig them out. But yeah, I thought this one was good. L Lucas, great point as well. Sometimes I feel like we just kind of, by happenstance, stumble into episodes that are kind of thematically similar to where we are in the year. And yes, this is another entry into, I would say, like, well, I'm, Arthur Halloween episodes. I remember some time ago, uh, one of our listeners asked us, like, the best Arthur Halloween episodes, you got to throw this one in there too. And then, and that's uh, good to say because it's I'm glad that Arthur can still be entertaining uh, in season 23. And I really want to give it up to Citizen Shake. I, I, you know, Shake is another one of those characters who this is, I believe, I don't wanna, I'm not certain, but I'm pretty sure this is his only other feature episode. And I really liked that they, that they approached this topic with a character who I wish was around a bit more, but we did so in a way that felt really res not just respectful to uh, immigrants to America, but also very intuitive of the type of struggle that uh, American immigrants may have and the confusing feelings that comes along, especially in younger kids who 
are going to become Americans, but don't want to give up on the culture that they've come from. So I thought this was a really great way to portray it. Uh, they made Senegal culture. They made Senegal look really cool, which I appreciate. And I think that this was a really smart, smart and uh, heartfelt way to go about it. Uh, which is Arthur's specialty. I thought this I thought this was great. I, I actually quite like this episode. I too really enjoyed this episode and it's a good balance of pop culture, uh, humor and a solid message. like you said, it's it's applicable not just to American immigrants, but anyone who is trying to not assimilate but kind of fit in with a new culture uh, while still staying in touch with their original culture. And what better way to tell that story, Will, than having to switch your favorite wrestler <laughs> or feeling the pressure <laughs> to do so. So I thought this was a very empathetic episode, but I thought it wasn't overly cloying and treacle either. It was funny. Yes. It was There was brevity in the what, in what is, is a serious subject. And I like... Um, uh, Shake as a character. I, I, you know, I know that we're running out of Arthur episodes, so I feel like I, we're not probably going to see that much more of him. But uh, I think he's great. I think he's a good addition to you know the Bud and DW age group. Yeah, I wish I wish he would stick around. It's also interesting to have this episode so soon after we talked about an episode that was that you related to the immigrant experience with when rivals came to roost, and this is making that even more explicit. And, of course, Arthur, typically on the right side of history in terms of welcoming people into this, into not this country, but North America, let's say, which, you know, we should all, I feel we should all take that stance. But, man, great start to this season. And I'd said it before, but, like, you know, these three episode seasons, these OVAs, they only have so much time to work with. So they have to kind of get it right right away. And this one did. So I'm actually I've actually got quite high hopes for what we've got next here. So Lucas, I'm glad you could join me for this uh season premiere and you're going to be joining me for the Patreon episode that's going to be coming up for Elwood City Limits patrons at the end of the month. Now, I first want to say that we've already we've already made the announcement and I'm sure this isn't news to you by now that you know, once we finish up with Arthur, we're going to be finishing up regular uploads of the show. The other the other goal that goes alongside this is that, well, I want to wrap up our Patreon content by the end of the year. And so I just want to make that explicit. And, and it's always been, you know, at any time, you can feel free to cancel and, like, no harm, no foul. And as I've said before, if you're already on the Discord, we're not going to kick you out. I'm far too lazy for that, so you can stick around. The Discord but will live on, yes. Discord will live on. But I also want to say that we will have Patreon content up to the end of the year, including this month. And so, really, that means that September, this episode of For the Kids, is going to be our last one. This is the last time that we're going to be covering a different kids show. And I know that leaves a lot on the table and I'm sorry for everyone who was hoping that we would do this show or that show. We simply were never going to be able to do them all really, especially if the end of Arthur was what we were recording things by. But the one that we're ending things with feels very appropriate to where we started. Our first one was postcards from Buster and our last one is going to be Mark Brown's new show for kids, mm. Hop. Hop oh, just came out this year. This is one of the newest things that we're going to be covering on any part of the podcast. Literally, it came out like we just had new episodes drop a couple of weeks ago. So this is available in Canada and America. And the best thing about it being so new is that there's a lot of sources to pull from. So I spent today doing a lot of research, and I'm going to be bringing it here and then we're going to be watching some Hop, and we're going to see how the Arthur legacy continues on here. Uh, Caleb's email was talking about how in a new Arthur series, he would want people, uh, perhaps on the autism spectrum, or people of low vision to be represented. Well, Hop is that show. Not only continuing on the legacy of Mark Brown and people involved in the creation of the Arthur show, that is explicitly what they're trying to do with that show. And you'll find out more about that if you're subscribed on Patreon and join us for the final episode of For the Kids as we talk about Hop. 
And Lucas, as I kind of mentioned, you've got a busy month ahead of you. I'm going to be very happy to record uh, the episode on Hop with you. But for this next episode, I'm going to be calling in a guest, a special guest, one that I know a lot of our listeners really responded quite positively to. And they are going to be joining me for the double episode of this season, and that's When Duty Calls. And, I mean, Lucas, <laughs> the good news is is that you'll be missing out on the LaDonna episode. Woo! <laughs> So, but uh, something tells me you might want to watch it in your spare time. And of course, we will be covering it completely next time here on Elwood City Limits. September has begun. The school year is in again to all of our student listeners and teacher listeners. We wish you all the best to everyone who may be listening involved in the Halifax Public Library strike. We wish you nothing but support and solidarity, and we wish you the best. Please support your local library workers wherever you are, and support your local library, for goodness sake. We've got lots of fun stuff coming up for September, including special guests, Patreon content, and something else that's going to be happening this month. A special type of episode that will be coming your way on Patreon and the free feed uh, on a Friday. And just a couple of Fridays, actually. So I actually have to get to work and uh, continue to edit it. So until then, Lucas, can't wait to see you again here, and we'll hold it down for you. But until next time, wherever that may be, that's going to do it for Elwood City Limits. My name's Will Young, and for Lucas Mancini... What, I have how many cavities? We'll see you next time.